Hello, I'm Jennifer Sanders Tut, local history librarian, and welcome to History Shrieks. Not only is this our special October local history program that focuses on tales of terror from St. Joseph's history, I'm very excited to be able to team up with True Crime Time this month and bring you the unsolved murder of Harriet Moss McDaniel from 1916. History Speaks is always presented the first Saturday of each month and focuses on topics specific to St. Joseph's history. True Crime Time is hosted by our wonderful downtown branch manager, Jen Wildhagen, and every second Thursday of the month, Jen presents a new true crime story ripped from the headlines. We will begin our story today by meeting the members of the McDaniel family. Sarah Harriet Moss McDaniel, named for her mother, but goes by Harriet, is 33 years old in 1916. Her husband, Oscar D. McDaniel, is also in his early 30s and the prosecutor for Buchanan County. He had been in the prosecuting attorney's office as an assistant prosecutor for several years before being elected prosecutor. He even worked with Harriet's father, Luke H. Moss, who had also been an assistant prosecuting attorney before retiring due to his health. Oscar McDaniel has, at this time, in July of 1916, just announced his re-election campaign. The McDaniels have three children, two sons, and one daughter. Odell is the oldest, at about 12 years of age, and then there is Helen, who is eight, and finally Marion, who is five years old. And from there, our story picks up on the evening of July 14, 1916. Version 1. 11.30 p.m. Oscar McDaniel receives a telephone call from someone claiming that his brother is drinking at Hart and Blakesley's Saloon at 6th and Missani. They said he was in a state and that Oscar needed to come get him. McDaniel takes his automobile downtown. When he arrives at the saloon, his brother's not there, and he realizes the call was a fake. He heads back to his home at 1806 South 20th Street. He pulls into his driveway and parks his car. When he gets out, he is shot at five times. He returns fire. The shooter flees. McDaniel is not hit. McDaniel goes into his house, goes up to his bedroom. There he finds his wife Harriet lying on the floor senseless, her head terribly beaten. He says, When I reached the garage, I got out on the north side and was near the front of the machine when someone fired at me from the shadow of a tree on a terrace about 50 feet to the south. He fired at least three shots. One of these shots struck the automobile hood and made a dent in it. Either this shot glanced and made a hole through the upper corner of the windshield on the right of the machine, or another shot penetrated the shield. By that time, I had ducked behind the front end of the machine and I fired five shots, as near I remember. When I reached the house, all the lights were out. Upon reaching our room, I found Mrs. McDaniel on the floor, her head a few feet from the head of the bed on the east side, and her feet near the foot of the bed. There was blood on the bed, and more blood where she had fallen. On the west side of the room is the dresser. The second drawer had been ransacked, and about a third of the contents were thrown on the floor. It was from this direction, evidently, that the blow was struck which killed Mrs. McDaniel. Version 2. Oscar McDaniel worked in his garden in the early evening before having dinner at home. After dinner, he takes his automobile downtown to the Enterprise Lodge at 7th and Charles Streets. There, he stayed only a short time. He had been informed of un some unsavory dealings going on at a house at 17th and Buchanan Streets. He arrives at that house at about 9 o'clock and watches it for an hour. He then goes to a house just north of Henry Vay's house. Vay had complained to him that a woman living there was selling bootleg liquor. He stays there about half an hour. He then drives home. It is now about 10.15, and McDaniel is about to go to bed when the phone rings. The caller identifies themselves as Dovey Hart and tells McDaniel that his brother Charlie is down here drunk and causing a disturbance. McDaniel takes his automobile downtown to Hart and Blakely's saloon at 6th and Missani. Charlie wasn't there. The bartender suggests McDaniel check the other saloon, owned by Hart at 8th and Missani. Charlie isn't there either. McDaniel buys drinks for everyone there. McDaniel then goes to the Priven Saloon. Charlie isn't there either. On McDaniel's way back home, he offers patrolman John Kierman a ride home. McDaniel and Kierman are not acquaintances. McDaniel returns home after dropping the police officer off at his home. He pulls into his driveway and parks the car. 
When he gets out, he is shot at. He returns gunfire. He then runs into his house to get his Smith & Wesson revolver that he kept in the bedroom. He finds his wife Harriet in a pool of blood. He speaks to her, but there is no answer. He picks her up off of the floor and puts her in the bed. He gets a basin of water and a sponge to wash the blood from her face. He then telephones the police, stating an attempt has been made to murder my wife. He asks the police to call a doctor, saying she has been beaten and is dying. An ambulance arrives and McDaniel rides with her to Ensworth Hospital, where she dies later in the morning. These are the two versions of events that Oscar McDaniel told at different times after the murder. The murderer's path through the house. McDaniel states that he was in the habit of checking all the exterior doors before going to bed every night. However, he admitted that he may have neglected to lock the cellar doors that night. Now, multiple people, including Harriet's family, would state that unless the murderer intimately knew the layout of the home, they would have had trouble navigating it. The supposed path the murderer took began at the cellar window outside. The window had a screen on it, but a slit large enough to fit your hand through had been cut. This would allow someone to reach in and undo the latch. The window opened into the washroom, which from there led to the stairs up a small hallway, which led to the kitchen, dining room, and reception hall. The first room they would have come to was the children's room. It was thought the murderer went through there first and ransacked the dresser drawers, even spilling a box of marbles. The two youngest children, Helen and Marion, were asleep in their room, which was separated from their parents by a walk-in closet. At no point during this or during the murder did either child wake up. The oldest child, Odell, was staying with his grandparents that night. From there, the murderer went through the closet into the bedroom where Harriet slept. The crime scene. Harriet had been beaten by a blunt instrument. The police and newspapers assumed it was the butt of a gun. It was a gruesome scene. The newspapers stated her head in front and on top was terribly mashed and part of the brain was oozing from the wounds. On her pillow and sheets was a bloody pool with bits of skull and brain and hair. This led authorities to believe that she had been attacked while lying down. There was more blood on the floor where McDaniel said he had found her. There were no signs of a struggle. The murderer took Harriet's wedding rings and was thought to have gone through a dresser in the bedroom taking some cash. No bloody fingerprints or other clues of that nature were found at the scene. It was thought that the murderer was familiar with the layout of the house. The police believed the crime had to have been carefully planned and executed with cunning. No murder weapon was found in the room. It was thought it had been taken when the murderer left, which is why the police thought it to be a gun. There was a single fingerprint found in the dining room, but it turned out to be blurred and useless. And an apparent meaningless imprint of a tennis shoe was found on the ground outside. Neither of these clues went anywhere. Initial theories. Theory number one. The murder of Harriet was thought to be part of a widespread plot that involved everything from including staff at the jail to a plot to dynamite the jail to break out prisoners. Because suspicion was cast on the jail, they did a search of prisoners' bunks. They found saws, acid for eating away at steel bars, and other paraphernalia for jailbreaking. Most of this theory centered around a man named James Barrett. Barrett had been sentenced to five years in the state penitentiary for robbery and was, at this time, awaiting trial on another charge. McDaniel was the prosecutor in that case. McDaniel claimed that he had received a threatening letter days before the murder that demanded the charges against Barrett be dropped or else. On July 15th, the day after the murder, six people were arrested on suspicion of being involved. That evening, the police went on an automobile chase through the county after persons of interest thought to be escaping. Theory number two. The phone call that McDaniel received was someone who knew about the murder plot, but wanted to save the life of McDaniel. The murderer broke in through the cellar window, killed Harriet to keep her from identifying them. They couldn't find McDaniel, so they hid in the garage until he returned. This theory supports that McDaniel, and not his wife, was the intended target. They fled in an automobile. Initially, the police thought the murder weapon may have been a heavy revolver because of the marks on her skull. 
and that the weapon was not found at the scene of the crime. Suspects. The initial suspect was a man named Ed Carboy, who was prosecuted by McDaniel for robbery. It just so happened that Carboy was also a member of the IWW, or International Workers of the World. At this time, it was thought that the IWW had been causing trouble in St. Joseph for several days. At the time of the murder, Carboy had just escaped from the state hospital after he had pled insanity at his trial. After the escape, McDaniel had received a threatening letter on July 7th. Carboy was close with a man named Barrett, who was also on trial for robbery. Police were unable to locate Carboy. Later, the police thought the letter was written by Barrett himself and smuggled out through another man named George Endicott, who was on bond for robbery. Endicott was arrested, questioned, and released in the same day. The letter that McDaniel received was written on an envelope from the Hotel Rivadue and mailed to McDaniel's office. At this time, the jail was located on the grounds of the courthouse, and the Hotel Rubidoux was located across the street on the south side. Anyone going to the jail could easily step into the waiting room in the hotel and secure an envelope. McDaniel used this as an opportunity to put the jail under scrutiny. At this time, they allowed visitors to bring in food. Many would actually smuggle paraphernalia and weapons into the jail via this method. The jail also used prisoners, known for their good behavior called trustees, to do various tasks and errands. They find no evidence to link the letter and the jailbreak plans together. They also never found out who delivered the letter. The timeline. July 14th, 15th, midnight. Harriet Moss McDaniel is murdered. July 16th, Harriet's funeral is held at Mount Mora Cemetery. The same day, McDaniel's re-election ad appears in the paper. July 17th, McDaniel makes his first public statement. If they think that they are going to intimidate me by the cowardly murder of an innocent woman and by the attack on myself, they are mistaken. I intend to go on just the same way that I have. July 18th, McDaniel calls for inquest into Harriet's murder. I felt that public opinion would be better satisfied if we hold an inquest, and for that reason, I asked Dr. Wisser to hold one. I want the public to know and feel that we are doing all that we can to bring my wife's murderer to justice. July 20th, the body of Harriet is exhumed, and a coroner's jury is called for the purpose of an inquest. The law provides that the coroner shall summon a jury of good and lawful men, householders of township, to appear before such coroner at a time and place in his warrant expressed, and to inquire upon a view of the body of the person there lying dead, how and by whom he came to his death. Coroner's Inquest Initially, at the time of death, the acting coroner, Dr. John J. Wisser, decided that an inquest was unnecessary. He also had stated he didn't think the coroner's jury actually needed to have viewed the body, but he also considered choosing from a pool of people who had viewed the body at the time of death. On July 21st, the coroner's jury begins by examining the crime scene. It comes to life that much of the evidence in the case is gone. In the early morning hours of July 15th, as Harriet McDaniel took her last breaths in Ensworth Hospital, her friends and neighbors burned her bed sheets and rug and scrubbed the floor. They maintained that they did this with permission from the police to save Harriet's family the horror of the sight. There were also dozens of friends, family, and those suffering from morbid curiosity who went through the house within hours of the murder. During the first day of the inquest, the shooting comes under much scrutiny. After viewing the bedroom, the jury examined McDaniel's car and the scene of the shooting. The number of shots fired that night by each party was undecided. Three or four shot from McDaniel? He isn't certain. Three shots fired at him? No, five. He isn't certain. McDaniel had initially claimed that he had fired five shots. A bullet, mashed flat, is found on the brick street about 15 or 20 feet in front of the garage. Five empty shells of a 32 caliber pistol are found in a pile near some trash bins. 
The jury is informed that McDaniel owns a 32 caliber pistol. The pistol has six chambers, but McDaniel claimed he always kept one empty with the trigger resting on it in order to avoid accidental discharge. He further elaborates about the state of his ammunition by retelling the account of him firing one shot at a rabbit on the country road leading to his father's house not long before this. That would leave four loaded shells in the gun. Neighbors are called as witnesses in the inquest. Arnold Berghoff, the neighbor across the street, stated that he heard five or six shots. Caroline Berghoff, Arnold's sister, states she heard five shots. Anna Madinger, guest of the Berghoffs, heard five shots also. E.E. E. Gard, who lived across the street from McDaniel, testified that he was on the porch when McDaniel left in his automobile at about 11.30. He stated that 15 minutes later, he saw the form of Mrs. McDaniel pass in front of the window of her bedroom. The shade was up, and he recognized the profile. She was in evening wear, he commented. Guard also stated that he didn't hear any shots fired that night. A.J. Herman, another next-door neighbor, saw McDaniel working in his garden at about 6 o'clock that evening. After that, he didn't notice anything until the shooting. He stated he heard five shots. The coroner's inquest came to an end on September 6, with the jury unable to arrive at any conclusion as to the perpetrator of the crime. They asked that a special grand jury be summoned. McDaniel and the Grand Jury On September 24th, Oscar McDaniel is arrested on the charge of murdering his wife Harriet Moss McDaniel. It is first-degree murder. He was arrested at his home at 7.30 that evening. He asked the arresting officers if they would permit him to walk to the police station instead of calling a patrol wagon. They acquiesced, and he was booked at 8.55. He was shortly after transferred to the county jail and housed in the hospital ward on the fourth floor. He was, more or less, allowed the run of the place. Special prosecutor assigned to the case, Bart Lockwood, requested the arrest of McDaniel primarily because he claimed there was continued interference on the part of McDaniel and those who supported him. Lockwood even claimed that witnesses had been intimidated. Upon his arrest, the news press interviewed McDaniel in jail. They asked if he would be making a statement, to which he said, Yes, I believe I should, he answered. If I can get myself together enough to prepare it, I believe the people would be interested in knowing what I have to say. The issue of bail came up. Because this was first-degree murder, bail usually would have been out of the question. However, the prosecutor and the judge in the case went round about the issue. The judge saw no reason why, in this instance, there shouldn't be bail. Prosecutor Lockwood fiercely argued that because it was first-degree murder, it should be out of the question, and exceptions should not be made. The judge's mind was made up, however, and McDaniel quickly made his $50,000 bail with the help of some prominent friends in the city. And on the evening of November 1st, he held a public forum at the Lyceum Theater, where he appealed to the court of public opinion. He spoke mostly of himself. At the beginning of the grand jury trial, it takes both sides quite some time to whittle down the jury pool. Some of them knew McDaniel and were close friends. Others had already formed an opinion on the case, and no amount of evidence could change their minds. Because the charge was first-degree murder, the death penalty was possible. Many potential jurors were disqualified due to their staunch moral opposition to the death penalty. The Moss Family November 5th, 1916. Oscar McDaniel makes a statement that morning, and as the Moss family puts it, freely uses their names in defense of himself. A Gazette reporter interviews the family. It is a flowery, melodramatic piece, but the quotes are presented as verbatim. The same grieving one said, Oscar gave the names of the flowers which he and Harriet placed in their little yard, but he did not tell his audience that he has not placed one of these flowers on his wife's grave. In fact, if you will study his speech, you will see that he has said almost nothing about his wife. It was all Oscar and what he had done. He told how he had built himself up in the world without aid, but he forgot to tell of the $10,000 farm that his father gave him. 
This is in line, at least, with the picture the newspapers paint early on. In his first public statement, he only refers to Harriet as Mrs. McDaniel, not by name, and not as my wife. If the rough profile gleaned from the newspapers have any truth to them, McDaniel was probably a narcissist, or a sociopath, or perhaps some mixture of both. The family states they had known Harriet had been unhappy for at least a year or more. They mentioned that Harriet was very active in her church, but McDaniel had not accompanied her in years. But he did go with her the Sunday before her murder, which made her very happy. This is now only a couple days before the election. Some friends of McDaniel take out an ad in the paper and print the initial testimony of Sarah Moss, Harriet's mother. This was during the coroner's inquest, before McDaniel was suspected. In that testimony, Sarah Moss had stated that she thought Harriet and Oscar had a very happy marriage. The election, November 7, 1916. Oscar McDaniel, the incumbent, loses to Lawrence A. Bothwell by over 3,400 votes. The trial. The contents of the trial, day to day, could be its own presentation. This murder trial was so notorious that they printed the verbatim transcripts in the paper daily, and this took up multiple pages in the paper. So we will just be touching on a few highlights. The trial formally began on November 18th. Both sides' cases hinged on the time of death. The state has the time of death at 10.30 p.m., the night of July 14th. McDaniel's entire defense was based on his alibi. His attorneys argue that the time of death was after 11.15 that evening. This was after when McDaniel claimed he received the fake phone call that called him down to the saloon. Furthermore, the prosecution intended to show that McDaniel had been having an affair and that Harriet knew about it and that they were nearing a divorce. And Oscar McDaniel knew that a divorce would ruin his career. The special prosecutor, Bart Lockwood, addressed this in the prosecution's opening statement. The evidence will further show, gentlemen, that the statements and complaints, some of them were communicated directly to the defendant himself, that some of these complaints between husband and wife were heard by other people, and the evidence will show further that on the morning of July 14th, this wife, the murdered woman, was warned that her home would likely be broken up by a certain woman in this town. The prosecution went on to lay out the unhappiness in the McDaniel home and Oscar McDaniel's intent to get rid of Harriet. This was by means of everything from taking out an insurance policy on her to fabricating threatening letters sent to his office, to making statements when out in public about the nervousness of his wife at the time and how he couldn't stay out late as he was afraid something might happen to his family. But on the night of the murder, he went out for an extended period of time. The trial began with somewhat of a sensation. The first witness was Dr. John J. Wisser, acting coroner. He testified that McDaniel had stated he didn't think anything would be gained from an inquest at the time of death. Once Wisser notified McDaniel he was going to call for an inquest, he stated McDaniel asked him to say it was McDaniel who had requested the inquest. The next witness, Dr. J. L. Cox, police surgeon, testified that it was his opinion that the murderer was left-handed. It was said that Oscar McDaniel was left-handed. There was expected to be explosive witness testimony against McDaniel. However, every witness called by the prosecution seemed to fizzle. Harriet's sister, Aline, was to testify. It was thought the knowledge she had would be damning. It was supposed to be in reference to the state of the McDaniel's marriage. However, once on the witness stand, Aline's testimony painted McDaniel in a negative, if unpleasant, light, but not enough to suggest that he was a murderer. By the beginning of December, all of the evidence in the trial had been submitted. Most of the evidence was circumstantial. The hard evidence in the case, the bloody bedsheets, had been burned. In the closing remarks of the trial, McDaniel's attorney spoke for over five hours. On December 5th, 1916, after less than two hours of deliberation, the jury reached a verdict of not guilty. Oscar McDaniel was acquitted of murder in the first degree. Epilogue. 
Throughout the trial, there had been rumors circulating that McDaniel was having an affair. The other party to the affair was said to be Dagmar Crucker, who was married to John Crucker. McDaniel, though prosecutor, had acted as Mr. Crucker's divorce attorney. The Crucker divorce was finalized on the day that Harriet McDaniel was murdered, bringing the case under even more scrutiny. On February 18, 1917, John Crucker attempted murder-suicide of his ex-wife. He was successful in the murder, but not the suicide. John Crucker survived, though he never recovered, and eventually died on May 26, 1917. After losing the position of prosecutor, McDaniel and his assistants opened a private practice across the hall from Bart Lockwood. On July 28, 1917, barely a year after Harriet's murder, McDaniel married Zora Cook. Though it was known in social circles, the couple had been intent on wedding since the beginning of the year. The Cook family were neighbors of the McDaniels at the time of the murder and testified as witnesses. In 1919, the McDaniel house at 1806 South 20th Street mysteriously burned down. McDaniel was credited with rescuing his family from the blaze. In February of 1920, McDaniel and his family disappeared from St. Joseph. He had run up thousands of dollars in debt to the local banks. It was thought that McDaniel's remaining friends knew his whereabouts, but refused to say. McDaniel changed his name to Russell Harry McDrew and lived the rest of his life under that name. He may have bounced around the country before settling in California, where he worked for the poultry producers of Central California. The rest of his family also changed their names. His second wife, Zora, became Anna, and on March 16, 1929, she died at the age of 33 after a lengthy illness. McDaniel, now McDrew, remarried again on May 8, 1930, to Anne Rosemary Zayner. He listed this marriage as his second. The end of Oscar McDaniel's life is shrouded in mystery, and perhaps apocryphal. It was said that when he died in 1936, his last wish was to be buried next to his wife Harriet. So it was said that Russell McDrew was quietly buried next to Harriet Moss McDaniel in the plot owned by Oscar McDaniel in Mount Morris Cemetery. And to this day, the murderer of Harriet Moss McDaniel has never been identified.